Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction, what we think is the best show on the web for all things infertility. I am Dr. Rahi Victory, a fertility specialist here in Canada with US board certification. Nice to have you all join us. Um, we have a really cool topic tonight, which is whether or not your first beta HCG test value is predictive of a live birth and if the level needs to be changed based on your age. So super interesting topic. I don't think anyone's ever looked at it before in this way. And uh, this was a great study. So I thought I'd bring it to everybody's attention. And uh, we'll, as usual, take all your questions after we uh, review the topic. Um, special thanks to uh, Tarek from uh, Ibrahim Strategies Group, who is uh, running the show as always off to the side. And I think I want to start a contest for people to send in their ideas of what Tark looks like, because he has been our mystery guy for some time now. So uh, he's like the Stig from uh, um, the uh, car show uh, in the UK. So uh, let us know what you think. Um, in the meantime, we are um, uh, super excited to have you all join. And uh, like I said, we've got a great topic. So we'll give everybody a second to jump on. Um, feel free to start asking your questions now. We do tend to take them in sequence. So if you ask now, we will answer them, but be patient and watch the first part and we will get through to the second part of the show. Um, are we good for audio? Yeah, we are. All right, great. Um, one thing I do want to talk about is uh, just briefly before we start and to give everybody a chance to jump on is everybody is still panicked and worried about the COVID vaccines and fertility. So I've been watching some of my um, colleagues and uh, friends out there on social media who have postings about the vaccine and the amount of people out there that still think that this negatively impacts your fertility is astonishing. So let's deal with the basics. Number one, there is not a single study in existence that shows that the COVID vaccines negatively impact your fertility. Number two, there is at least one study and now a second one coming out that shows that being vaccinated actually may be beneficial in terms of preventing miscarriages. And certainly we know that the risks of pregnancy from getting COVID are very, very high and the risks of pregnancy from being vaccinated are zero, literally zero. There is no pregnancy risk associated with being vaccinated. So uh, the things that are being said are still completely nonsensical from the standpoint of someone that lives and breathes this every day. It's actually quite ironic seeing what other people say, in some cases, almost laughable. The best example is this study of how the fat droplets are accumulating in the ovary. Okay, so the study that looked at fat droplets accumulating in the ovary was a study in which they gave 1,000 333 times the human dose of the COVID vaccine to a rat. And then they dissected the rats and they looked at their ovaries and found that 0.1% of the vaccine ended up in the ovaries. Okay, well, if I gave anybody 1,333 times of anything, you'd end up with 0.1% of it in your ovaries. So the studies that are out there that people are referencing, they are abusing to drive their agenda. And I have no idea what their agenda is or why it is what it is, but it's maniacal that people are using this and saying, oh, look, it's damaging ovaries. It does not damage ovaries. It has no negative impact on your ovaries. It couldn't have a negative impact on your ovaries if you wanted it to. So it's very, very important that people understand that they need to be vaccinated. So please stop listening to all the people out there that are putting out stuff that is absolute nonsense and get yourself vaccinated as quickly as you can. Okay, so tonight's topic is a up and coming article uh, called the predictive value of serum human chorionic gonadotropin concentrations for pregnancy outcomes of in vitro fertilization in women of different ages. So essentially what they wanted to see was, does it make a difference in regards to your age, what the predictive threshold of your first beta HCG test is, and should we adjust the threshold based on age? So this is being done in a center in China. A lot of great IVF work actually comes out of China because they have such huge numbers uh, of cycles. 
um, and a very robust academic kind of environment. Um, so essentially what they did was <clears throat> they selected patients who had undergone a frozen embryo transfer only. They used only grade four and high or fair quality embryos. So AA, AB, BA, BB, or AC, CA, BC, and CB, but not CC or CD or anything below that. Um, and they were all grade four, so these were expanded blastocysts or further. And they took all of the patients that they had found within the time frame that they were looking at, and they examined what their outcomes were. So several kind of interesting things. Number one, they didn't use anyone with donor eggs. They didn't use anybody using natural cycles. They were all programmed hormone-based cycles. Um, they didn't use anyone that had a day seven blastocyst, which is important. And um, they didn't have any uh, transfers of monozygotic twinning cycles where you had twins or ones that ended up with ectopic. So they excluded all of those. They just looked at the ones that were coming out with a single live birth uh, outcome and or pregnancy at least, clinical pregnancy, and then subsequently live birth. Um, if they had patients with fibroids, they removed them. Um, they took all the normal precautions and it was quite standardized. So they broke their study group up into three groups. There was group A, which was less than 30 years of age. Group B, was, which was 30 to 34 years of age. And group C, which was 35 years and greater. And that's important to remember because we're going to show you some, some data slides in a minute. Okay, so um, what they did was they analyzed how many patients that they had um, and found that initially there were 876 cycles, but they had to exclude some because of inappropriate blastocysts that were applied or they had uh, not done their blood test on the right day and so on. And interestingly, and we certainly don't do this here, but maybe I'll change based on the study, these folks are testing on day 10 after their frozen embryo transfer. So 10 days after the frozen embryo transfer, they are testing to see what the beta HCG level is at. Most places wait 14 days, 16 days. These guys are checking on day 10. So they ended up with 772 cycles in total um, from uh, June 2016 to December 2019 and 566 cycles ended up in a positive HCG test 10 days after the transfer. So that was a 56.09% um, clinical pregnancy rate and a 44.95% live birth rate subsequently. So we're gonna show you the first figure, which is figure two, that's the one with the two little graphs. And um, these are called area under the car curve graphs or ROC graphs, okay? So what they did with this is demonstrate that there is a threshold that gives you very high sensitivity and very high specificity for both clinical pregnancy and live birth. So for clinical pregnancy, the beta had to be 113.28 milliunits, international units per milliliter. And for live birth, it was 146. So what does that mean? If you got a value uh, 10 days after your frozen embryo transfer of 146.37, you had an extremely high chance of resulting in that live birth. So 95%, or sorry, 92% uh, uh, area under the curve, which gave you a sensitivity of 94.8% and a specificity of 82.4%. So very, very robust, robust numbers, highly predictive, okay? When they analyzed this further, what they then said was, let's look at what factors actually contributed to the value, the HCG value, and they looked at weight and age and um, your endometrial thickness and your blastocyst quality and, and how many days your blastocyst was and so on and so forth. So with that, if we go to table two, you have table two there. So looking at table two there, you can see that age was predictive. So less than 30, you had the positive p-value, 30 to 34, you had the positive p-value. They're using greater than 35 as their reference. So those groups have higher success rates, um, much, much higher based on age. So obviously the younger you are, the higher the predictive value and that we all know already. What's interesting here is that they found that the blastocyst quality 
was the only other thing that was significant, and that was extremely significant, showing that the lower the quality of the blastocyst, the lower the chances of success. And in this uh, particular analysis, it's a 70% reduction in success. So a huge, huge difference if your blastocyst quality is poor compared to higher grade embryos. So we always talk about the embryo grade. Some studies say it's important, some say it does not. What this is predicting is not necessarily the live birth, but the fact that these factors were predictive of the HCG, which then in turn was predictive of clinical pregnancy or live birth. So then they went on further, and um, you can go to maybe table four if that's okay. So they analyzed whether or not your age played a role. So in table three, which I'm not gonna show you, they demonstrated that in the different groups, if you use that 113 clinical pregnancy beta HCG value, that the sensitivity and specificity and the positive and negative predictive values dropped with each age group. So in the initial group A, you have a 96 uh, percent positive predictive value. I mean, that's insanely high, right? That's fantastic. So you get a beta of 113. You basically are saying there's a 96% chance you're going to end up with a baby at the end of it, okay? Or in this case, a clinical pregnancy. When they looked at group B, it dropped down to 94.6%. And when you get to group C, it dropped down to 88.7%. So very, very significant differences based on age. You're dropping almost 10% in predictive value from going less than 30 to over 35. And that's not even that big a time span. Like I would have thought they would have paid it even wider. And I'm sure the data would be even more robust if they looked at an over 40 age group. So in table four, what you can see is they rejigged the numbers. So they said for group A, if we use a uh, level of 145, your positive predictive value is 98%. So if you get a 145, you got a 98% chance of ending up with a clinical pregnancy, which is a baby with a heartbeat. In group B, in order to maintain that same kind of threshold of very high 95.8%, you needed a beta of 126. So a lower beta when you're older is still gonna correlate with a very high chance of a pregnancy. And the really interesting thing is that when you're in group C, you're over the age of 35, you can actually tolerate an even lower level of beta. It's only 94.44, and you're still getting a relatively robust chance. Now, the numbers do drop off. You're looking at about an 88% chance or predictive value. So it's not quite as strong, but they did demonstrate a very high negative predictive value, meaning if your beta is below that, there's a very good chance that you will not result in a clinical pregnancy. So if your beta 10 days after your frozen embryo transfer is less than 94, you have an extremely high chance that that will not go on to be a meaningful pregnancy, unfortunately. So this is really a game changer for us because when we advise patients, we say, oh yeah, your beta is over a certain threshold and we're happy. But this is actually saying that you should be changing that threshold based on the patient's age. And now we can actually give patients rock solid information with data to say, you have this percentage chance of moving forward or this percentage chance it's not gonna move forward. And so that's very, very valuable data for us. So is it a factor of fiction that the beta can predict a live birth and that age makes a difference in which beta? It's actually a fact that the beta does make a difference and we should be following specific values for specific age groups. Now, what are the drawbacks of this study? Well, for sure, they're looking at a very select population. They were all Asian patients, obviously, so how applicable it is to the rest of the world, I don't know. Um, it should be similar nevertheless. Uh, their BMI groups were not quite as high, so how much of a role that plays in the North American population where BMI tends to play more of a role can be significant. And then of course, although this was a fairly large study, in the grand scheme of things, we're not talking about thousands of cycles, we're talking about 722. So more data would be even more impressive. And this may be something that we can kind of figure out from looking at other research databases. So I'm hoping I might be able to access that. So this is a very, very rich, interesting study, which gives us some really key information we never had before, that your age in predicting your outcome 
can make a difference just specifically looking at a positive beta. So if you got that positive preg test and you're cringing, you wanna keep coming back to make sure it's doubling, this is actually telling you, you might not even need to do that. You may be able to tell just from that first beta based on how high your chances are um, with numbers like 98% positive predictive value. So thank you for watching that part of the show. Hopefully you've all been uh, watching and asking your questions in the meantime. We are gonna take your questions now. We do find from time to time that um, some members have drifted away and then come back and we do answer your questions. So if you've asked your question twice, um, if we're not answering it the second time around, it's because we've already answered it. So just go back and watch the show again later. Remember all of our videos are on YouTube. So uh, if you wanna watch them there, you can certainly watch them there. And we are uh, happy to uh, uh, review any topics with you if you ask us, not a problem at all. So uh, I'm ready to take questions. What have you got? So this one came from YouTube. Okay. Um, four days ago. Oh, wow. So they had a question on there and they wanted- They to are on the, the ball. They are on the ball. <laughs> and I thought this would be the first question we open up with. All right, cool. So she said, uh, not sure if you will see this, but I had issues with anemia before and bleeding to where I needed a blood transfusion. Wow. Okay. Um, I was on BC for three months and my cycles have become more regular. Okay. Would I still be at risk and likely unable to take aspirin because of previous bleeding issues? Um, it depends on why you were bleeding. So if you were bleeding because of a bleeding disorder, you definitely shouldn't be taking aspirin. But if you were bleeding because of a fibroid or because of your hormones being out of whack, um, that's a completely different story and we should be looking at that. So um, you need to know if it's a bleeding disorder issue or if it's an issue of heavy bleeding related to something else. Um, certainly if it's the something else, it's manageable. If it's a bleeding disorder, you should not be on a blood thinner for sure. Great question. No one's ever asked us that. Very true. Hopefully, if you're watching the show from YouTube, you've got your answer. If not, it'll be on YouTube. We should probably type an answer to that yeah. one too. Uh, okay, 